the scenario very well. Uh, now the time is for our second session. Uh, but before starting the second session, I want to share with all the virtual participants uh, in Pakistan and globally that uh, last Saturday we hosted the first edition of Afghanistan conference. We already compiled the report of uh, the first session. And after today's conference, we will compile the second uh, report. And hopefully on coming Wednesday or maximum by coming Thursday, we will launch the, both the reports uh, covering the complete details of the discussions with the recommendations. And uh, we will upload uh, the reports, both the reports, on our website, nutshellconferences.com. Nutshellconferences.com is our website. So please visit our website on Thursday morning to check the details of entire two conferences. We will also circulate and we will hand over the hard copies to the concerned officials in Pakistan and in Afghanistan. Our second session is a very important session. I carefully uh, engage uh, six experts. They are foreign policy experts. They spend their life in this field. They are practitioners. They served on different assignments throughout their career. Six foreign uh, policy experts and diplomats from Pakistan. Our session topic is Pakistan's foreign policy and changing geopolitical scenario. Moderator and chair of this session is our very dear friend, Ambassador Nahmana Hashmi. She served as Pakistan's ambassador to China, Ireland, Belgium, and European Union. Our panel speakers are a very renowned uh, foreign policy expert, one of the senior most uh, foreign uh, policy practitioner in Pakistan, Ambassador Aziz Ahmed Khan, who is Pakistan's ambassador to, uh, uh, he served as Pakistan's ambassador to Afghanistan and also head of Afghan affairs. Ambassador Tamina Janjua, she served as Pakistan's foreign secretary from 2017 to 2019. And she's also a member of Corporate Pakistan Group as well, in addition to Ambassador Nahmana Hashmi. And for me, she's very respectable as well. And we are actually, uh, in the future, we will be the next door neighbors in Islamabad because our land, we are about to start construction of our houses. So she's my neighbor as well. Our third uh, speaker is my favorite, my very dear friend, my elder. Ambassador Abdul Basit. He served as Pakistan's High Commissioner to India and also Pakistan's Ambassador to Germany. We worked together when he was Pakistan's High Commissioner in India. And I personally experienced and witnessed how effectively he worked on outreach for Pakistan's narrative. Our fourth speaker is another brilliant foreign policy expert, Ambassador Asif Durrani. He served as Pakistan's Ambassador to Iran and UAE, and also Deputy Chief of Mission to Afghanistan. Of last but not the least, uh, the fifth uh, speaker is Ambassador Sayyid Abrar Hussain, and he served as Pakistan's ambassador to Afghanistan, Nepal, and Kuwait, and a special secretary for foreign affairs also. So this is 75 minutes dialogue on Pakistan's foreign policy and changing geopolitical scenario. And uh, over to you, Ambassador Lahmana Hashmi, the moderator of this session. Thank you very much, um, SN, and thank you very much uh, to Nutshell and uh, Corporate Pakistan Group for uh, organizing these series of conferences on Afghanistan because uh, it is uh, absolutely required and needed that uh, uh, we discuss the situation in Afghanistan very carefully and we weigh our options, policy options in Afghanistan very carefully also. Um, we all know uh, that after the very sudden and chaotic uh, withdrawal of the US uh, forces from Afghanistan, the Taliban are now in Kabul and uh, hoping to form an inclusive government to take the things uh, uh, forward. Uh, a lot of people are saying that these are the new Taliban. These are not the Taliban of the 1990s. 
uh, but I would like to add that neither is the world, the world of 1990. Uh, the geostrategic and geopolitical and also the geoeconomic uh, environment of the world and particularly of our region is in a flux. We have seen uh, lately that um, USA, after a very long and a very costly war in Afghanistan, uh, has failed. A lot of people around the world are saying now that uh, basically USA is uh, a waning power. On the other hand, we now see China uh, emerging as a the next superpower of the world, its phenomenal development, economic development, and its uh, fantastic strides in technology have uh, earned for itself a place which is uncontested. And it has now become um, a big challenger for the US, but the, the foreign policy tools that are being used by the USA and by China are very different um, and uh, particularly because we are in in south asia uh, for us it is very important because we are neighbors uh, to india and also to china and also to afghanistan a region which is of deep interest both for the united states and for uh, china and particularly caught at this time um, in the u.s strategy of trying to encircle and contain china we need to watch our, uh, our foreign policy very, very um, carefully. A lot of people are saying um, that uh, the current situation in Afghanistan has left both a political and uh, a security gap. Uh, yes, it is a vacuum that will hopefully eventually be filled. But there is a misperception or a, or a, or a wrong assumption that is uh, going around that China may fill the security uh, and the political gap. I really don't think that uh, China's policy allows it to interfere in other people's internal affairs or to put its uh, soldiers and armies on ground in other countries. Uh, but to discuss all this and to discuss the role that China will play and uh, how Pakistan can coordinate its policy with China and other neighboring countries to see that Afghan peace and uh, security returns to Afghanistan and that we can engage with Afghanistan and also uh, with the region to ensure the socioeconomic development of the whole area. So to discuss these, uh, we today have a very good panel of uh, very eminent uh, diplomats. So let me first and foremost invite uh, our senior colleague, Ambassador Aziz Khan, who was the ambassador in Afghanistan, if I'm not wrong, at the time of the first uh, Taliban regime. So I would like uh, him to start and set the tone for this uh, discussion. So over to you, Ambassador Aziz Khan. Thank you. Thank you, Nagmana. Uh, and uh, thank you for inviting uh, uh, me for this um, important discussion. And uh, I look forward to inputs from my other younger and brighter colleagues uh, on this very important subject that we are uh, touching upon uh, today. <clears throat> of, uh, Pakistan's uh, geographical uh, location has placed it at the crossroads of Central Asia, South Asia, and Western Asia. And one had imagined uh, that uh, this would prove an economic boon for the country, and we would play uh, an important role in what was being termed as geoeconomics. But unfortunately, developments around us for the moment are an impediment to that, and in fact, we are at the moment bracing up to handle the difficult situation, the challenging situation that is uh, in Afghanistan, uh, with the recent developments, as we are all familiar and I, with, and I'm not going to go into the details. Uh, apart, uh, so the, 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 the establishment of peace in Afghanistan is the foremost priority 
for all the countries in the region if, and as well as the larger international, uh, international community. Of course, being a neighbor and having a long border with Afghanistan, this affects us the most. And for Pakistan, it is particularly important that uh, uh, this, this, uh, that peace is established in Afghanistan. And for that, Pakistan has been endeavoring since a very long time. Uh, it, it is uh, as if the Afghan challenge was not enough. We also have a neighbor on our eastern uh, side, which has been a constant challenge to our foreign policy since the creation of the two countries. Uh, I'm talking about India, and uh, I think while we go about uh, developing or while we go about our business, one has to keep an eye on our neighbor, which has not given, uh, lost any opportunity to take advantage of situation where it could put Pakistan to harm. So this, the, these, the, these are the two primary challenges, and of course, other challenges coming out of it, with the India, India getting close to Afghanistan, to, to sorry, to uh, uh, United States, creates another challenge in our relationship with the United States, which we have had since the inception of the country, and by and large, a, a good, uh, good relationship, a mutually beneficial relationship. So, but at the moment, I think the most important that we should discuss, and since the time is very limited, is the situation in Afghanistan today. Narmana was right uh, in saying that uh, I was uh, ambassador in, uh, in uh, Afghanistan during the Taliban's first tenure. In fact, I arrived uh, in Kabul three months after the Taliban takeover of Kabul and uh, re remained involved uh, with the Afghan affairs first as uh, ambassador to Kabul and uh, subsequently in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs handling Afghanistan uh, till 9-11, uh, uh, after 9-11 and all the uh, uh, removal of the Tal Taliban government. At the, uh, we have two uh, people are talking about that this is a different uh, Taliban that has taken over today in Afghanistan. Yes, they are different to a certain extent. We will have to wait and see whether the change is really uh, uh, is really a real change or it is only cosmetic. Earlier Taliban uh, uh, were difficult, but there was reason for that. As uh, if we go to the history of the Taliban, they came on the scene in late uh, 94. At, at a time when Afghanistan was divided among more than 400 warlords. There was, uh, the, the, the government of Kabul was not even in control of all of Kabul, or, although it used to claim itself as a, as a government of Afghanistan, but they didn't even control the whole of Kabul. Taliban were a product of that struggle against the warlords, which started uh, uh, from Spin Baldak, and gradually they gained strength. I will not go into the the details because that will become a long history. Uh, even at that time when they were considered very difficult, they had made certain attempts at reaching out to the world. They were wanted to interact with the world. There were people among them who wanted change. And it was, I personally feel, and I personally felt disappointed at that particular time that despite the Ta Taliban gestures, the world ignored them. It was only Pakistan uh, which was interacting with them. Uh, UAE and Saudi Arabia had recognized them, but they were. But it was just not much of an interaction. Uh, it was only Pakistan which was interacting with them. This time around, hopefully, there will be a better understanding and better interaction. And we have, we have seen signs of that. Taliban have also acted pragmatically. They have claimed, they have stated that they are going to have an inclusive government. They, they will take everybody along. They have said that the women's right will be honored, even if they are making references to Sharia, but that is different interpretations. And one has to see what kind of interpretation of Sharia they give to the women's, women's rights and minority rights and uh, etc. But for the moment, I feel, I feel optimistic. I feel optimistic that Afghanistan has not, apart from the uh, dastardly carnage of two days ago, uh, perpetrated by Daesh, things have moved rather smoothly. There are no harassments. There are there is no civil war. 
there are no flux of there are no refugees yes there are certain Afghans who have been internally displaced who wish to get out of the country uh, for uh, and they may have genuine reasons of uh, to to fear and uh, of, uh, fear of reprisals but uh, by and large the situation is normal the business is as we see the, the images on the television the life is uh, more or less uh, normal in, in, in kabul and taliban statements whatever they have been coming uh, give a sign a sign of hope uh, we hope that uh, there will not be spoilers who will be there to uh, spoil the situation we hope that the international community uh, interacts with the taliban constructively and understands that there is need to, to for, for Afghanistan to get back on its feet. It has seen too long a, 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 a period of uh, hostilities and uncertainties. Almost uh, two generations have grown up not knowing peace. Uh, uh, so we have all to pitch in. And Pakistan will have a very important role to play. China will have a very important role to play. EU should have should play an important role and so does the united states which is responsible has been responsible for bringing in a lot of misery to afghanistan so i uh, there's a lot more that one wants, wishes to go on but i'll leave it to a later uh, question answer session uh, i will stop here for the time thank you very much uh, ambassador Zizan, for your very comprehensive remarks i would now request uh, ambassador Tahmina Jandua. Uh, to make her opening remarks uh, at the conference. Mute. We can't hear you. Unmute. We cannot hear you. Can you hear me now? Now I can hear you, yes. Okay, sorry. I said thank you very much, Nagmana. Thank you, Asper, and thank you, Nutshell for this opportunity to have an important discussion on Afghanistan, because Afghanistan is something that we are now sort of eating, breathing, everything. I will try to focus my comments on the impact on Pakistan and the policy and practical measures that need to be taken in my understanding of the situation um, in Afghanistan, as far as Pakistan is concerned. So to begin with, our strategic objective should remain a peaceful, stable Afghanistan, which they can then proceed on an economic trajectory, which is good for us and for the region. This is simpler said than done because of an increasingly adversarial geopolitical environment. I wish I could be as positive as Ambassador Aziz Khan is. Uh, there are positives there, but one must uh, also take into account the difficulties that we will face in the, in the near future as well. There's a very strong effort underway by India and members of the former Ghani regime to spin the narrative that there has been, quote unquote, an invasion of Afghanistan by the Taliban and a return of, quote unquote, terrorism to the region. This theme was projected by the representative of the former Kabul regime in the UN Security Council debate in Afghanistan and is a precursor of what uh, has been is being written and is expected to be written also in the in the media and spoken of. For now, the Taliban have done well in their relatively peaceful takeover of Afghanistan. The Taliban have de demonstrated maturity and sophistication in the conduct of their policy. The two attacks, unfortunate, and we strongly condemn them. Uh, at people standing at the at the Kabul airport killing 170 Afghans or so and 13 U.S. soldiers is only a demonstration of what could come to Afghanistan. This increases the pressure on the Taliban to speed up the setting up of an inclusive, broad-based government in Afghanistan. I would therefore recommend, one, we should keep our strategic objective clear i.e. a peaceful, stable Afghanistan, which facilitates our econ economic and security goals and, of course, is helpful for the people of Afghanistan. All actions should be aimed at achieving this goal, and there is no need, and I would underscore the fact, there is no need for grandstanding on the part of anyone inside Pakistan or elsewhere. Secondly, we should be cautious, keep monitoring the fast-evolving situation, 
and not um, a situation. Thirdly, as, an important, as important as the substance of our policy, the manner in which it is articulated and conveyed, especially to the Afghans, is critical. Hence, we should avoid making too many public statements on the Afghan situation. The statements should be limited to the Ministry of Foreign Affairs because it's the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and the foreign policy uh, makers who understand the nuances of the policy and the impact it can have internationally and, in, and to the Afghans. Fourthly, our policy should be modulated in consultation with China, Russia, Iran, and the Central Asian Republics. The foreign minister's visits to the Central Asian Republics and Iran and his earlier conversation with Foreign Minister State Councillor Wang Yi have been useful in this regard. Um, a decision on recognition, fifthly, can be taken, uh, should be taken in consultation with regional partners. We should not do it alone, nor be seen to be too keen about it. In any case, discussion on recognition in public is premature until the Afghan talks lead to a conclusion. Uh, uh, sixthly, there is an immense anger in the United States about the so-called abandonment of Afghanistan. We should avoid any official comments about the failure of the US in Afghanistan, publicly sharing of, for, of credit for developments in Afghanistan, or discussing uh, any points of uh, referring to the def so-called defeat of the US. This is not required, is not even completely true, and therefore we should avoid it. Um, there is no need to get in the middle of US internal policy politics, especially when the US administration is being attacked from all sides within the country. Um, <clears throat> we should refrain from any pronouncements on the Afghan situation which instigate anti-US sentiments in Pakistan. Next, we have, we have been saying that there should be an inclusive government in Afghanistan. If a broad-based government is not formed, acceptable to all major groups in Afghanistan, opposition to the Taliban will quickly emerge and there can be a reversal of the present situation. Afghanistan's history bears this out. And therefore, it's critical that the, the focus on broad base remains. The Taliban themselves and then their pronouncements have, token, have spoken about inclusive, and it could be useful. Next, we, uh, we may could be our concerns about the recent announcement of the TTP to strengthen their re relationship with the TTA. But all this has to be done uh, in consultation with the Taliban as well. We should look at the possibility of providing humanitarian assistance to the people of Afghanistan to help avert a humanitarian disaster, which, lead, which would lead to exodus of guns to uh, Pakistan and Iran in particular. This should be done in concert with the UN, OIC, and other regional countries. Pakistan cannot do this alone, and Pakistan needs the help and would need seek the support of our friends and partners, especially the multilaterals in this regard. I would also like to stress on the importance of Pakistan's image question, which is uh, crucial. We need to debunk the commonly held views against Pakistan and have a sophisticated strategy to convey Pakistan's point of view, both in the mainstream and social media. There was an article yesterday in the New York Times uh, by Jane Bellies on which there were some very sweeping uh, statements that were made. We need to counter these statements. It is not the government of Pakistan only, but it is our own media. It is our thought. It is our pol policy makers. It is our opinion makers, and it is those of our people, of our friends, who go to the media to uh, go and talk about it and repeat such uh, absolutely absurd assumptions. At this point, the international community requires Pakistan's help in evacuations and addressing the refugee issues. We have not yet faced the full brunt of the media and even official onslaught against Pakistan. We've been having comments, uh, this, uh, phone calls by different leaders to the prime minister, to the foreign minister, etc. But the time will come when people will start uh, slinging 
all kind of uh, words at Pakistan as well. And we need to be prepared for that with our very clear policy on each of the issues that has been raised and that will be raised. We need to be prepared for it with responses laden with facts. Uh, I saw a graph of Afghan refugees intake globally yesterday, and uh, Pakistan stood at the top with Iran, much less at number two, and the richest countries with very few, a few sprinklings here and there. And then the demand on Pakistan and Iran is increasing to take in more refugees. Let us not forget the grueling experience of asking for resources for Afghan refugees last year, which has been, which has been uh, drastically reduced. The response has in the past, in the recent past, been absolutely pathetic for the more than 1.5 million refugees, registered refugees and 1.4 million unregistered refugees that are in Pakistan. We have to understand. And uh, as far as refugee flows are concerned, I was watching a program yesterday in which there was a flow of refugees standing at the borders of Pakistan, ready to enter Pakistan. Who is going to take care of this? Who will ensure that terrorist elements do not join these refugees to enter into Pakistan and create trouble? We have had a very difficult past where we, there are soldiers and our, our, our um, non and our police have all lost have lost so many men and have so many families have lost their heads, earning heads, and. And we have had huge losses and economic losses as well. We do not want to re-enter the phase where we have to face the same kind of terrorism. And this is one where we need the support of the international community, where all of us today and elsewhere need to pronounce on the difficulties Pakistan has been through and may be going through if the demand on Pakistan increases to take in more refugees and to try and address the situation in Afghanistan, which is not uh, within our control. Finally, I'd like to put in a few immediate tasks, a few messaging issues, and a few points on by building our capacity, something that Harun Sharif Sab has said as well. As I said earlier, there is no need to grandstand. We have to look at all this, the entire Afghanistan issue with great maturity and to see how we can uh, work together with the international community, with China, with the regional countries, and with, uh, with whoever, whichever government comes to power in Afghanistan to ensure that peace returns to Afghanistan because that is the demand of the Afghan people. So in the, in the immediate task, First, there should be a relentless focus on peace. In the immediate tasks, one, we must, keep, we must keep facilitating a peaceful, stable Afghanistan. If, do, if this does not happen, all bets are off. Second, urgently respond to the humanitarian needs. Thirdly, uh, the, re the reality is that our religious ethnic affinities cannot stop the influx of refugees. So let's be prepared for it, even if there's a small, even if they are not too much in numbers, but we cannot, uh, we will have to accept some of them. Uh, on the question of recognition, do not act in haste, act in concert with key regional players. Uh, fifthly, encourage regional engagement with Afghanistan. The core should remain Pakistan, Iran, Russia, China, and the Central Asian republics for a broad-based government. Sixthly, keep UN on board, UN and other international organizations on board. And lastly, do not try to impose our views on the, pre on the proud, freedom-loving Afghan people. On the messaging issue, I'd like to make a couple of points. First, keep statements to the minimum. Second, give utmost respect to Afghan sensitivities. Third, avoid anti-US statements. Four, develop a narrative, the, uh, the media, academic, and official narrative to escape, uh, to, to rebut the inevitable media, academic, and official narrative to scapegoat Pakistan. And I must say in this regard, I have a, I have a great concern that when Steve Gold's book, 
um, director, directorate S came out, there were very few people who wrote in Pakistan rebutting what was being said by Steve Cole. And hence, globally, it was accepted as the truth. And it was accepted in Pakistan as well, as is by many people as the truth. We have to rebut these statements. Otherwise, they become the words, uh, the divine word, so to say. Finally, on building our capacity, I com I'm convinced that there are few people who understand Taliban structures. There are few and far who under understand the ideological views and modes of government of the Taliban. It is important that we get to know about these issues and how there are differences between the different parts, parts within, Afghan, within the Taliban as well, and the different parts of uh, the Afghan uh, political scene. Secondly, uh, I have noticed it uh, in the recent past that there is a very superficial understanding of India, its political elite, what it expect, what it wants of Pakistan, and what we think the the, uh, the our, our expectations are. We need to educate ourselves you know, more. May I find the, I'm just about to finish. Okay. I'm about to finish. That was my last point. Um, and finally, on SEO in Afghanistan, uh, just to update those who said that we should work for SEO membership, Afghanistan's SEO membership of SEO. Afghanistan uh, has applied for membership of SEO, but when Pakistan and India had become members of the SEO, uh, the, the large members of the SEO, both China and um, Russia, had said that the expansion had, had taken place and they want to wait and see how that goes. I'll stop here. Uh, thank you very thank you. much for your detailed uh, uh, expose. Um, and I'm sure that your very substantive recommendations will be considered uh, in the corridors of power and policy makers. So thank you very much once again. But may I kindly request the following speakers uh, to keep their opening statements strictly uh, to four minutes so that we can have a longer uh, question and answer and interactive uh, session. Thank you. I would now request uh, uh, Ambassador uh, Abdul Basit, who was our High Commissioner in India, and uh, it's never uh, an easy job to be uh, High Commissioner to India, and it would be very interesting uh, to hear his uh, take on how India may uh, act or react to the Taliban uh, coming into Afghanistan because they are uh, they are friends of the West and we have seen that they have uh, been the troublemakers in Afghanistan and particularly for Pakistan and Taliban have now very clearly said that they would not allow their territory to be used uh, for uh, terrorism against any other uh, country and uh, we have also seen that India um, uh, was one of uh, the countries that uh, closed its mission and withdrew all its diplomats, which were also very strongly criticized by one of the former uh, Indian foreign ministers himself. Uh, so uh, over to you, uh, Ambassador Abdul But Kindly keep your opening remarks to four minutes. Thank you very much. Uh, Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Uh, Assalamu alaikum, everyone. Since I have four minutes, so I will uh, make only two points, which I think of. Uh, uh, huge importance. Uh, uh, first of all, I think we should be very clear that uh, our objective vis-a-vis -vis Afghanistan uh, continues to be that we want a stable, peaceful, uh, a moderate, uh, and a terror-free Afghanistan. Uh, an Afghanistan uh, which does not have uh, safe havens uh, and uh, which, uh, whose uh, territory is not used uh, for terrorism uh, anywhere in the world. But let me assure you that uh, a peaceful, stable Afghanistan, that objective is not shared by every country around the world. Uh, there are countries uh, whose uh, interests lie uh, if Afghanistan continues to be bleeding, uh, continues to be in turmoil. So we will have many spoilers uh, in this game. So my fear is that uh, we should not uh, get complacent that uh, all countries around the world 
uh, do want a stable and peaceful Afghanistan. Accordingly, it is very important that uh, uh, Pakistan, uh, uh, because you know we have the tendency to to get excessive uh, in our rhetoric, and in the process we uh, tend to uh, uh, lose focus of our ultimate objective, uh, and uh, hence end up you know our diplomacy becomes candy floss in the sense that it uh, loses uh, any substance and uh, becomes you know uh, uh, a matter of optics so in my view uh, pakistan should keep in view uh, the definition of diplomacy that diplomacy is the art of uh, accepting the feasible in order to achieve the desirable so that will that provides you the linkage between your strategic objectives and your ability to show uh, tactical flexibility and maneuverability. My second point, the last point is that Pakistan should not get carried away by this mantra of uh, uh, inclusive and broad-based government. Let's you know, uh, be very clear. The Taliban uh, were ousted from the government uh, by force and they achieved uh, and the restoration of the Islamic Emirate of Afghanistan through force. Nobody has given them, you know, on a platter. Uh, it is a different story that they did not uh, uh, face any resistance, but uh, uh, they did uh, resist the foreign occupation for 20 years. And uh, now it is, in my view, uh, this whole business of inclusive government is a ploy because no broad based government would be able to come up with with you know with the solutions to the challenges which government is uh, facing or afghanistan is facing at the moment this is a ploy to keep afghanistan unstable uh, it's a government at cross purposes so we should be very very careful because and leave it to to the taliban if they are saying that they are ready to have an inclusive government, let them decide as to how they would go about it. There is no need for us to formulate a regional policy as to how, how the inclusive government uh, should look like. This is none of our business in my view, because countries who are insisting on this, that Afghanistan should have a transitional government, should have a broad-based government, they are not sincere to the cause of a peaceful Afghanistan in my view. So let that be to, I mean, we leave it to the Taliban, because if we insist too much on this and it, it becomes a precondition to their international legitimacy, I'm afraid that we would uh, uh, push Afghanistan towards a precipice and a retrieval precipice in my view. It will be very difficult to redeem them. So I would suggest that uh, Pakistan should be very careful, uh, though it's a kind of, you know, uh, uh, this inclusive government, Taliban have said that, I, 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 I can see that. But uh, we should not be seen as putting preconditions or to be part of that process, uh, which leads to setting preconditions for the recognition of the Taliban. I fully agree that Pakistan should not be recognizing the Taliban government in haste, but that does not mean that we cannot work behind the scene in order to push other countries like China, Russia, and the neighboring countries towards uh, early recognition, because that will help uh, uh, the Afghan government to be on the right side of the history rather than, you know, uh, uh, to be seen as, uh, once yet again, a pariah government uh, and going nowhere. I remember that, you know, Henry, uh, Dr. Henry Kissinger once said that uh, opportunities uh, were never lost. Uh, uh, someone will take uh, the ones you miss. So this time round, I think we need to be more careful. Uh, I would not like to see uh, discussing uh, Afghanistan's, uh, you know, the, this is, uh, 20 years down the road, uh, the uh, Afghanistan conundrum. And, you know, uh, it is time that we should be focused. We should be very clear about our long term objectives and uh, pursue them uh, in a in a manner uh, that is required. I mean, you should be uh, short on uh, uh, bombastic statements, but uh, more clear about our long term objectives is at the Afghanistan. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Ambassador Basit, for your very comprehensive remarks um, and keeping well within the four 
minute uh, time limit. I would now um, request uh, my very good friend and my batmit uh, uh, ambassador Abrarase, who has also been the uh, our ambassador to Afghanistan. So he has seen Afghanistan up close and uh, has a very good understanding of the uh, of the makeup of Afghanistan. Uh, so I would ask Mr. Abrar to share his take um, on the situation in Afghanistan, particularly with reference uh, to the possibility of uh, intra-Afghan uh, reconciliation and its uh, impact on where Afghanistan goes. Um, Ambassador Abrar, over to you. Rahman uh, Rahim. While we will be dis uh, discussing in detail a number of things, including this formation of government and reconciliation uh, in uh, uh, our discussion after this and in our question answer session as well. Right now, in these three to four minutes, I'll try to give you what are Pakistan's interests in Afghanistan, what are our objectives, our goals there, and what should we do to achieve these goals. Well, to say briefly, our number one interest is that Afghan soil should not be used against us. For this, we need two things. Number one, peace and stability in Afghanistan. Number two, a strong and friendly Afghan government that has control over all parts of Afghanistan, especially areas bordering Pakistan. And then, we also need a peaceful and stable Afghanistan for so many political and economic reasons, for stability in the region, for access to Central Asia, for regional projects such as TAPI, CASA 1000, CPAC, and so on. But how to achieve these objects, these goals? Well, I'll suggest just three, four points. Number one is we should continue our efforts to bring peace and try to facilitate. And uh, as Ambassador Basit said, we should not be uh, putting it as a uh, conditionality, but we should try to facilitate establishment of a broad-based government in Afghanistan. And when one such government is formed, we, along with other neighboring countries, should recognize it. I agree that uh, we shouldn't do it in a haste and we shouldn't be alone to recognize that government. We have to consult all the regional countries and I believe that government of Pakistan is already consulting the regional countries. The foreign minister's recent visits to Iran and Central Asian countries are perhaps a part of it. And then uh, we should try to help the new government economically. Uh, a lot has been said about it, especially in the previous session, they discussed the economic impact of uh, the current Afghan scenario. Uh, but then let's see how we can do it. Perhaps we can encourage the regional countries as well to help Afghanistan economically. And we should continue our economic assistance to Afghanistan. We have already been doing it even when the previous government was there. We have been helping them in reconstruction and development of Afghanistan, and we can continue with such packages. And then, as uh, Ambassador Tahmina also mentioned, uh, if there is a humanitarian crisis, if whenever there is a requirement, we should immediately respond, immediately address to that humanitarian crisis. For example, if there is a shortage of food, if there is a shortage of medicine in Afghanistan, we should be the first ones to help them. And then one another very important point is that uh, we should try to fill the vacuum uh, there, which has been caused by the departure of Western and Indian advisors. You know, uh, there were a number of Western trainers and Indian advisors in uh, almost all the ministries in the army of Afghanistan. Uh, and there were Indian advisors even in the NDS. So now when there are no trainers and no advisors, there is a vacuum and they need much of help. So Pakistan and the other regional countries such as China and Russia can help them in this regard. Well, I'll stop here 
and uh, we'll dis discuss the other points uh, such as reconstruction and reconciliation of Afghanistan. And then uh, apart from these possibilities, uh, the <coughs> of uh, uh, an inclusive government in Afghanistan. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ambassador Abra. Uh, may I now call upon uh, um, Ambassador Asif Durrani to make his uh, opening statements. And um, uh, I just happened to glance through a very comprehensive paper that Ambassador Durrani has uh, uh, written uh, about uh, the situation in Afghanistan, its implications, and the policy options uh, for Pakistan. And I'm sure during the question answer session, we can dilate more on that. So over to you, Asif Durrani. Uh, thank you, Narwana. Thank you very much. And uh, much has been said. Uh, and I think the tone was set by Ambassador Azizan, and uh, who is a veteran on Afghanistan. And uh, of course, uh, Ambassador uh, Abrar has further uh, enriched the discussion because being the uh, expert on Afghanistan, I I did serve in Afghanistan and have been uh, looking after, uh, I mean, focusing on Afghanistan a little bit, yes. In my view, I think uh, 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 the U.S. withdrawal have uh, certain implications. And uh, one is that the, as far as recognition issue is concerned, the Americans and their allies, they are going to play the hardball. And they will, in fact, base uh, their uh, conditionalities on human rights issues. Uh, they are likely to put economic sanctions, which they have already done. And uh, the delisting issue with the United Nations uh, uh, Committee 1988, which is Taliban Committee, is very much there. And Americans have been in violation of the agreement with the Taliban uh, last year that they had promised that uh, Taliban would be delisted by 31st May 2020, but it did not happen. Nevertheless, Taliban are still traveling and uh, almost 148 uh, Taliban uh, figures, uh, I mean, important people, they figure on that list. Uh, so uh, on humanitarian, I mean, uh, financial and economic sanctions already United States has imposed almost uh, you can see that uh, uh, nine billion of uh, of one son's uh, nine billion dollars have been frozen. And similarly, uh, IMF has also blocked Afghanistan's access to uh, 460 million dollars. And then uh, more than that, uh, last year, uh, uh, 60 nations had pledged uh, 12 uh, billion dollars uh, for Afghanistan. But uh, those also seem to be uh, now not available for the time being. And mind you that Afghanistan, uh, Afghanistan's three-fourth budget uh, is actually uh, foreign aid driven. So uh, you can see how big challenges now the Taliban are going to face. And related to this, uh, now uh, uh, you, since uh, we have also discussed uh, the, Indian hand in Afghanistan, they have been very much involved. Ambassador Basif had also referred to the challenges with regard to inclusivity and uh, the, uh, that we should be careful. And I think uh, the Taliban now have realized that in the past uh, they were reclusive and that their reclusiveness did not pay them much. And this time these Taliban are changed. They are quite different than what we uh, found them 20 years ago. And this inclusiveness is actually has come from the Taliban themselves. Uh, so they want, but it may not be the uh, case that they may not perhaps allow the old guards to join uh, the inclusive government, but uh, it is possible that they may give representation to all the ethnic and religious minorities in the future government. At least this is the contours which are being discussed and those are being commented upon uh, uh, in the international uh, media. And, uh, and so we, are, we have to look at that. But at the same time, I think the uh, Taliban also face challenges from within, which uh, they'll have to look at it. And that is that uh, uh, the Shia minority uh, and uh, almost 10,000 uh, Fatimians who 
who have been trained by Iran. And now uh, there are reports that they are back. So they'll be waiting in case that the component of the attitude is. Uh, I want uh, the uh, armies, uh, the uh, people, they are there. Yeah. Ambassador Asif, your uh, audio is breaking up. So I don't know people where is the problem. People, uh, Taliban and, uh, uh, yeah, well, uh, this is what I also faced uh, while listening to people. Uh, is it okay now? Is it okay now? Yeah, it, it is better now. Can you hear me? Well, uh, yes, well it's I beyond my control. Me. I can't do much on that. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, then uh, I think we should also be uh, prepared for... Uh, um, uh, uh, some uh, bad things can happen, and those bad things, uh, some of them um, we should uh, be prepared. One is uh, that the capacity of the Taliban is not much, and so is uh, our capacity, I'm afraid. Uh, the problem is the CPEC uh, Ambassador Asif Gurani, I think you're again breaking up. We can't hear you. I think a while. Uh, Ambassador Durrani fixes uh, his audio problem. Uh, I would now like to move to the question answer session. And I have, uh, I'm not an Afghan expert at all, like uh, the other panelists. So I uh, do have a lot of questions. So my first question I would like to address to Ambassador Aziz Khan Sahab. Uh, sir, as you know, that we, it has always been our contention that we do not want to see a security role for India in Afghanistan and uh, an economic role maybe in terms of uh, economic uh, aid and projects, but certainly not uh, a security role. And now we have seen that there uh, are basically at the moment three kinds of vacuum existing in Afghanistan, a political, economic and a security vacuum. Now, um, the economic vacuum, uh, there has been consensus during these two sessions uh, that the international financial institute, uh, institutions and the developed countries and the regional countries, particularly led by China, uh, should step in and fill the economic and developmental gap. Uh, hopefully, the Taliban uh, would be able to uh, announce a government soon and fill the political gap. But uh, what is your take uh, on uh, the security gap in, in, uh, in Afghanistan and India's, uh, how do you see India's role and other um, countries' role in this? China, we know, uh, would not uh, be interested um, in a security kind of a role because that's not their policy. So over to you, Ambassador Zista. I think at the moment, moment we need to <clears throat> we need to co concentrate our attention on formation of an inclusive, stable government in Afghanistan. At the moment, everything is in a flux. Once an, a government is formed, and that government is recognized and recognized by all the country or majority of countries, only then can we think 
about other aspects. As far as the role is concerned, I think at the moment, the way India has uh, carried itself as far as relations with the Taliban are concerned, since the time Taliban came on the scene, I don't think they will have much of a role to play in any aspect for the time being. They, 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 it will take a little while. Taliban are a very cautious breed of people. They move very carefully. They will look at things very deeply before they move in any particular direction, asking any country to provide any role. And particularly as far as security is concerned, I think they would jealously guard their own turf and they will see to it. And I'm sure they're quite confident that they, they, that they can look after that aspect. Uh, and they, they will, you saw how, you know, and particularly after the easy victory that they have had, I don't think they'd be overly worried about the security role of any country. Yes, there is, uh, they might require certain inputs and help to rid their territory of all the other characters who have taken refuge there, like the TTP, like Daesh, ISIS, and so on. And we have to, that is where they would need the help. And that is where we should provide them the help, which would be very difficult to provide, considering that most of these characters are holed up in the Kunar area uh, and Ringarhar area, which are very difficult, very inaccessible places. And a lot of people can hide there. And uh, their numbers are is not that large. So we'll have to, they will, we will have, we have to provide them help particularly as far as intelligence is concerned, so that this menace is completely eliminated. So we, we have, uh, as, uh, as the rest, yes, economic help, we have to provide them generously as much as possible, the entire international community. And I see China playing a very important role in that. Again, uh, going back to the earlier period, China was, uh, apart from Pakistan, China was the only country which was quietly providing help help to, uh, to the Taliban, and uh, their main contribution was providing connectivity, because in those days, uh, 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 telephonic connectivity, because if you in those days, I, there were no telephones, landlines, or cell phones were unknown in any case, but uh, there were no telephones in, in uh, Afghanistan, and the only place where there were telephone connectivity was in Kandahar and Kabul and mazar sharif at the Pakistani missions. We had got the microwave lines and we had given some. So Chinese quietly started working in that and saying that if the, the, the landlines would be very difficult to uh, put down. They, they started work on the, on the cell phone network. And just before 9-11, this network had been completed. And the first casualty of American attack were the towers of this network. I think Chinese, again, very sensibly Will will provide the assistance, and of course, China has already committed to the uh, to, to the uh, and copper mines. Uh, they have already they had announced 3.2 billion dollars uh, of investment for and copper mines. They would be interested in the rare earth materials, etc. Et also, and they will come in in a big way, and it would be useful for the Taliban also to coordinate with them, and perhaps also become part of CPEC. This, this is the first thing that we, we would require. And of course, uh, I uh, just deviating from the point, I would just like to endorse uh, what uh, Ambassador Taimina said earlier. As far as we are concerned, we should speak less and do more. We have this tendency of having uh, in loudspeaker diplomacy rather than the true essence of diplomacy. And too many ministers in Pakistan make too many statements about the situation in Pakistan. Let the foreign office do that. It is very tempting uh, because it puts you in a, in a profile on the television channels in the evening to make a statement around foreign policy issues. But I think uh, it, is, it is not a very good practice. We should, we should refrain and we should clamp. up. In fact, even at the foreign ministry level, we should be very careful about making any statements and not shoot our mouths at a drop of a hat. I will, can go on, but I think I'll let, let it be here for the moment. Uh, thank you very can much, I make uh, a quick... for your um, a very, very constructive uh, contribution. Uh, I think um, uh, Ambassador Tehmina would like to uh, make a comment. So over to you, I... Tehmina. And then yeah. I have thank a question for Ambassador Abraham. 
A quick comment on on uh, the India Afghanistan thing. I think there was a press briefing yesterday, and it was clearly identified. And I I completely agree that is for the Taliban government when it comes into power to decide how it sets up these relations with any country in the world. It's an independent country, and it has its own. Of course, we have expressed our concerns, and will continue to express our concerns of the particular problems we had in the past about. Indian presence in Afghanistan, the present their presence uh, around the borders, there's consulates, the fact that they were using um, India the Afghan soil against Pakistan, the fact that they've gone ahead and said that their soil will not be used against any country is important, important and significant. The other point I'd like to highlight here is that I'm sure the the whoever is in in government in Afghanistan. The Taliban in particular, if, if they do, and they will, they appear to be making the government, they must see how the Indians have behaved in, as president of the UN Security Council in, the last, in this uh, last month, this month as it's about to finish, and how they have stopped uh, countries that have an interest, regional countries that have an interest in speaking about the issue, like Uzbekistan, Tajikistan, and Pakistan asked for to be to speak at the council, but were not allowed to do so. So I think they will be watching very closely, and they also have to understand. They also know what was happening in the past from within Afghanistan. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Ambassador Semina. Very well. It points now. I have a question for Ambassador Abrar here. Uh, Ambassador Abrar, uh, everything else will uh, follow peace and security within Afghanistan. And that peace and security cannot be achieved if the various factions uh, uh, within Afghanistan are not on the same page. And uh, so what, in your opinion, uh, is the situation of the various Afghan groups and is uh, an intra-Afghan dialogue or reconciliation in the near future possible? Uh, because uh, if that is not achieved, and God forbid Afghanistan again descends into the kind of chaos and infighting that we saw um, in the first, um, uh, you know, in the past 20 years, then everything here that we are discussing becomes meaningless. Uh, so your take on that, uh, Ambassador Abraham? This uh, government in Afghanistan, Taliban are also trying for that. During their previous regime in late 1990s, they were very reluctant to have this kind of broad-based government. In fact, Pakistan was trying even at that time to persuade them to have a patch up with Northern Alliance and make a broad based government. But th there was reluctance on their part. And uh, uh, we had this shuttle diplomacy, Ambassador Aziz Khan, who was my boss there in Kabul at the time, he knows his uh, uh, better than me. Uh, but now this time we feel that there is a difference. Now they are ready to have an inclusive government but on one on what conditions and whether the other side would agree to their conditions this is yet to be seen right now what we are seeing in afghanistan is that only panshir valley is out of their control apart from panshir valley almost all afghanistan is under their control so now they are talking to ahmad shah masood's son there and they are also talking to other ethnic groups within Afghanistan and other political stakeholders in Afghanistan. For example, we have seen that they've been talking to this three member council, President Karzai and Hikmat Yar and uh, Abdullah Abdullah and so many others as well. So uh, uh, apparently this time we have more chances of uh, having a broad based government in Afghanistan. Uh, so let's hope for the better. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Abrar. I uh, would now like to uh, go to Mr. Asif Durrani again because uh, I couldn't uh, actually hear his entire presentation because of the, the audio problems. Uh, but uh, uh, my question, uh, Ambassador Asif, is um, you have 
written this paper in which you have detailed the implications uh, for Pakistan. Uh, would you like to uh, dilate on how we address those implications and uh, how do we move forward uh, with uh, the Taliban uh, government in Afghanistan to ensure that our uh, interests are safeguarded? You're muted. Ambassador Asif Durrani, you're muted. Yeah, can you hear me now? Yeah. Can you hear me now? Yes. All right. Well, very briefly, I think I, I support the view which uh, talks about the regional approaches. I think we should do uh, about Afghanistan in tandem with the immediate neighbors of Afghanistan. Uh, otherwise, we'll be under tremendous pressure, So, which I think can also lead to some kind of uh, sanctions against Pakistan. So it's better to adopt the regional approach. Secondly, most importantly, which I think uh, uh, we should not celebrate Taliban's victory yet. The reason being that during the past 20 years, the major ethnic groups and religious minorities have asserted their identity and have strengthened their country for the respective regions. Right now, they are quiet because the militarily, the Afghan army just melted down. They did not want to fight. But uh, the, the city in Afghanistan is, remains very strong. And they have asserted them, which you have seen during Ashwani or uh, Karzai's time, when they wanted to remove some governors or uh, some other officials or ministers. So they refused to step down. And uh, they could not do anything. Even Americans were sitting there. So I think uh, right now, I think we should not. It would be premature to uh, give any judgment as far as Afghanistan situation is concerned. Taliban, yes, they are a unified force. They fought valiantly and their victory is spectacular. There's no doubt about it. But as far as the situation is concerned, it remains uh, you know, precarious and uh, we should not celebrate it yet. Yes. Thank you very much. Uh, um, my next question is uh, to uh, Ambassador Abdul Basit. And uh, uh, Ambassador Basit, um, you only took precisely four minutes for your for your remarks. Uh, so we would like to hear a little bit more uh, from you on uh, how you see uh, India's role in, in Afghanistan. And do you think that uh, it will become uh, a threat like it was in the previous Afghan uh, two Afghan governments uh, for us? The India operating its uh, cells from uh, Afghan territory and threatening Pakistan? Or do you think uh, that India will uh, now maybe play a more constructive role in, uh, in the future? Thank you very much. Uh, you know, I think we, we should all remember that it is not only about Afghanistan. Uh, it is also about uh, geostrategic and geoeconomic clash of interests uh, at both systemic and subsystemic levels. Uh, so my uh, worry is that, uh, uh, I mean, in as much as we would like Afghanistan to stabilize uh, and uh, to, to, uh, to, to put itself on a positive trajectory of economic development, my worry is that there would be many, many spoilers. Uh, and there would be spoilers, uh, internal spoilers, as well as external. And India is uh, no doubt one of them. Uh, if you uh, look at the media, Indian media, since 15th August, uh, you, would, uh, you can easily uh, assess that, uh, how disturbed they are. Uh, they have lost the space which was available to them during the last 20 years. Uh, to promote their interests vis-a-vis uh, -vis Pakistan uh, and also to uh, do whatever they wanted to do in occupied Jammu and Kashmir. So now that space has been lost to India. But I 
doubt very much that uh, India would be seeing, you know, sitting by the fence and watching the whole situation idly. Uh, they have already started building a narrative that uh, there were uh, organizations like uh, Jaysh e Muhammad and Lashkar Tayyiba who have been fighting with the Taliban. And even yesterday, there was a report, Deadline New Delhi, that uh, the chief of uh, Jaysh e Muhammad met the Taliban leadership in Kabul. So this is a kind of narrative which, uh, which also, in my view, uh, fits very well with the long-term objectives of the U.S. Now, we all know that uh, the U.S. and Afghan uh, India do have a strategic partnership. Uh, U.S. considers uh, China as their biggest rival uh, in the years to come. So I do not know how they would really leave or accept Afghanistan to be peace within itself. My apprehension is, and that's why you know I'm very emphatic when I said in my introductory remarks, that Pakistan should be very, very careful. Uh, we should not get carried away in the sense that, you know, we all want uh, a regional approach. We all want a consensus based approach. Uh, we all want Afghanistan, you know, to have a broad based government. But is it realistic? My own feeling is that uh, the Taliban, no matter how much they say that they are, they are ready for, a, for an inclusive government, they are still kind of, they would be reluctant to include the likes of Abdullah, Abdullah and Karzai. They would definitely like to have a broad government inclu inclusive of all the ethnic uh, groups. But uh, the question is, on what grounds? My own feeling is that the Taliban do need two to three years in order to consolidate their control position in Afghanistan. Thereafter, what I can see is that uh, uh, we, we should expect an Iran-like political system in Afghanistan. Uh, and uh, we should, uh, I mean, the world and sh the regional countries at least should be, should acquiesce in whatever the Taliban come up with. Because there would always be forces within Afghanistan who would never agree to whatever the Taliban come up with. Uh, so that should not really bother us. Taliban are capable of uh, you know, controlling the, 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 I mean, Afghanistan as, a, as far as security is concerned. But in the months ahead, you will see more air strikes as was happened uh, last, this today or last night by the U.S. So you will see all these things by the, by the, by the U.S. and other countries to, uh, to, to ensure that the Taliban do not settle down. And this is what my, uh, my how I look at uh, Afghanistan. India obviously does not at the moment have any good chance of working with the Taliban. Uh, and they did make some efforts to reach out to them, but the Taliban were not receptive. But if Pakistan pushes the Taliban too much, then rest assured, uh, the Taliban are smart enough to hobnob with India as well. Uh, and they can always exploit, uh, you know, our problems. Uh, I mean, uh, if, if we push them to, 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 the, to the wall. So uh, the Taliban uh, are a smart people and they, they know where their interests lie. Uh, and they would not mind uh, at some point in time to also engage with India, in my view. Thank you. Nakhmana, uh, please uh, take the uh, closing I'm remarks finding. because time is very short. Yeah, I'm Thank just you. winding up now. I think we've had a very comprehensive discussion and there are certain um, things which have emerged which I'd like uh, to summarize first and foremost. Uh, the sense that I got from the discussion is that uh, we leave Taliban and Afghanistan to sort their own political system for themselves. So while we are saying that we... It, should have an inclusive, the Afghans must have an inclusive government. Uh, let the Afghans decide what kind of an inclusive government they would like to have. Secondly, there seems to be a consensus that we should, uh, as far as recognition is concerned, that we should not go alone and we should have uh, depend more on a regional uh, approach to recognition. Uh, there seems also to be a consensus among all these speakers that what Afghanistan actually right now needs 
is economic support to ensure that it doesn't descend into uh, chaos and there is not a humanitarian situation. And therefore, the regional countries and uh, uh, the in financial institutions and the developed countries must unfreeze uh, the money that is uh, required by Afghanistan at the moment. But as the neighbor, uh, I strongly feel that Pakistan has always stood by Afghanistan. So we must maybe uh, take the initiative to send food convoys uh, to Afghanistan because there does seem to be a huge food shortage in Afghanistan. Similarly, um, as a neighbor that has uh, stood by them for last 42 years, maybe uh, we should also um, have a very clear policy on uh, Afghan refugees, uh, which will definitely uh, come and uh, we need to accommodate them. And uh, perhaps maybe at a later stage, also think about restoring uh, the border commerce and uh, the border markets, uh, which are so essential, uh, particularly for those uh, uh, regions uh, which are bordering, um, uh, which are on both sides of the um, border. There also um, is a consensus um, in the in the group um, that uh, we need to have capacity building for Afghanistan. In the last two years. Pakistan, in the last two uh, decades, Pakistan has lost a lot of public space, uh, particularly uh, to India in, in Afghanistan. And I think it is very important that we recapture uh, that public uh, space. So I would uh, fully endorse what Ambassador Kamina Jandua said in her intervention, that we need uh, to offer them courses, not only in our military schools and colleges, but also we need to uh, help them with the capacity building in, in the formation of the government, in banking, and in all other uh, areas where they might need help. Because right now, uh, everybody who is there in Afghanistan who had some capacity or some understanding of running the government and the, and the security have all uh, left. And uh, I also agree with uh, Ambassador Basit that we should really not push uh, the uh, Taliban uh, too much. Uh, in the end, uh, I would once again uh, like to thank both uh, Nutshell Conferences and the Corporate Pakistan uh, Group for organizing two extremely good uh, conferences in a row on Afghanistan. Um, as Ambassador Tahmina said, everybody in Pakistan is eating, seeing, and breathing Afghanistan, uh, rightly because our destiny and our uh, future economic development is linked to Afghanistan. It's a geography that we have inherited, and it's a geography that we have to learn to live with and learn to live with in a positive way. Way. Uh, so maybe my concluding thought would be that we need to, in Pakistan, very carefully uh, see and analyze where do we want to see our relationship with Afghanistan, let's say 10 years, 20 years down the line. Uh, so with those words, I uh, would like to conclude this session. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Asfar uh, for giving us this opportunity to discuss Afghanistan today. Thank you. Thank you, Rahmana, and uh, thank you, everyone. Uh, Ambassador Aziz Khan, Ambassador Tahmina Janjua, my friend Ambassador Abdul Basit, Ambassador Sayyid Abdar Hussain, Ambassador Asaf Durrani, and last but not least, Ambassador Rahmana Hashmi. Uh, without your participation, uh, this was not possible to host this conference. And our whole idea was to share different perspectives from policy experts, foreign policy experts, and national security experts, and also some economists on specific subjects.